So as Matt pointed out, my name is Ricardo Williams. I am the host of Nerd Night here in Orlando, Florida. And uh, we've been going strong for about seven and a half years now. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to see everybody in person very, very soon. Uh, but of course, we're going to wait until that when it's uh, the all clear where it's safe. And, uh, you know, obviously down here in Florida, we have a lot of talks about uh, space because we're close to the Space Coast. We've had a lot of great folks uh, who work at NASA, some, uh, some um, uh, professors and scientists who are over at our, our local universities come through and give some really incredible talks. And of course, there's the, the fun stuff, the science fiction stuff. And as a student of film, uh, as I am, I like to dive into that stuff. And um, when we were putting this together, I was thinking, how can I uh, talk about some things that are happening now, but are also kind of, you know, uh, kind of akin to what we do in Nerd Night Orlando. And, and it's interesting because it's difficult to kind of judge art, particularly film, not because of the subjective nature, but because when it comes to movies, they are just massive undertakings. And a film is literally a conglomerate of multiple art forms. So creative writing, design, acting, music, photography, et cetera. So to take this grand piece of art that requires sometimes hundreds of different artists and then have somebody just watch it on their phone or walk out of theater and say, uh, that sucked, well, that can be a little disappointing. And we, we see that a lot. It doesn't just happen uh, you know, with a movie like Tenet. It could also happen with a movie like Troll 2. You know, point is we do, we do ourselves no favors having vapid critiques of movies when recognizing that so much goes into something we should also consider that maybe more can be taken out of it and that leads me to a film that has divided many critics and fans and it's called man of steel now um we have quite a few franchises out there that provide a good template for what kind of intergalactic you know coexistence of species could look like um obviously star trek uh, Men in Black, maybe a Powerpuff Girls adaptation coming soon. Um, but I wanted to focus on Man of Steel in this talk because, well, I liked it a lot. And the problem is, I don't know very many people that share my opinion of the film. Um, now, a lot of film critics have admired it for, you know, or, or shown distaste for it because of the, you know, it said that it, they, it doesn't really answer a lot of narrative questions that are important to answer storytelling. Um, others have commented on the kind of the muted tones of the colors of the, uh, the, the color palette. And, you know, most people just don't like the, the general, like, sad, introspective portrayal of Clark Kent. And that, you know, obviously that led to people being upset about what happened with Zod at the end of the movie. Um, and I'll admit, I'll agree with one of those. It's odd that Superman is not in a bright red and blue suit. Now, obviously, Henry Cavill, you know, has the physique and the acting chops to pull it off. Uh, obviously, the average you know, able-bodied male would look silly in a suit like that. Um, so it's like, why didn't they just do the big red, white, and blue? Uh, so when you think about that, it's, I like to look at this and say like, the things that people didn't like about it are the things that actually kind of caught my attention because I saw something else. And I often like to say at Nerd Night that um, your interpretation of art says more about you than it does about the work. Now, you turn back the clock, Superman, uh, debut 1938, popularized the uh, superhero archetype and essentially defined its conventions. Most superheroes are actually judged based on how closely they are um, to Superman's uh, you know, basic characteristics. And you know, this led it to being the most popular comic for like 50 some odd years. And then you know, the popularity kind of weaned um, until we got introduced to a brand new superhero and his name is Christopher Nolan. Now, uh, when he was working on The Dark Knight Rises, uh, writer David S. Goyer uh, pitched Nolan this idea of kind of presenting Superman in a modern context. And of course, Nolan was impressed by it. And because of his popularity with you know, how great his films are, the studio jumped on it. Um, and Goyer actually said this, let me quote it. He said, I felt the fact that he was an alien was given a short stiff in past films and to a certain context, the comics as well. I remember saying to Chris, this is really a first contact story. If you strip away the superpowers, it would still be the biggest story that had happened in human history. Now, when I first saw Man of Steel, I immediately connected with this point in the plot, excuse me, in the, in the point of the story. Because here we are, Superman is easily the most popular character in fiction for the past like 100 years. And 
he's always been a story of first contact. But we don't necessarily look at it as that. We always kind of look at it as an, and let me, well, let me just go to the tagline here. So um, you look at this, the whole first hour, or excuse me, the first 30 minutes or so of Man of Steel essentially is showing us Krypton. It's establishing that this lead character is not from Earth. It's essentially not centering, you know, the establishing shots in this movie are not centering Earth at all. You don't even see the iconic, you know, they find him in the field scenario. You see the ship land on Earth. That's what you see. And it's interesting because Superman has always had the story. They didn't, they didn't retcon the, the Superman mythos. They essentially just used what has always happened and then just showed a different perspective on it and a perspective that really wasn't given very much attention. So I look at the tagline, uh, the, 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 the very famous quote from Superman, you know, he stands for truth, justice, and the American way. So what we're hearing as in this character is we're not hearing the ideals of his race. Now granted, he's wearing a symbol from his planet, but we're, we're essentially hearing him expel the ideas of the nation that he lives in. So we're not necessarily celebrating his culture. We're not necessarily even really kind of learning from him. We're just kind of imparting our own ideas on him. And it's interesting because there's a, there's a, a graphic novel that came out about uh, 15, 20 years ago, I believe. Uh, it's called Superman Red Sun. and essentially reimagines the character if he was, uh, if his ship landed in the Soviet Union. And you can imagine, you know, the interesting different timeline that would happen there, but it shows how he perpetuates their ideology as well. And it, and, and when I look at that and I look at Man of Steel, I don't necessarily see uh, this kind of futuristic or maybe even just modern kind of coexistence of species. I see kind of like some of the dystopian things that actually happen in real life. Now, granted, you could say that the things that are happening in real life are influencing how they portray the character now. But what I would say is that it's always been that way. We just haven't really wanted to look at that. So when you, you look at this particular scene in the film, when he first kind of introduces himself to the American government, um, of course, through essentially uh, being forced to, and they know he's not necessarily the bad guy, but yet they still have their guns drawn. Him. And of course, when they bring him in, he's handcuffed. Now, granted, this is not just one random shot for the movie. This is the poster that was first used to advertise the film to show this, this kind of dissection between like who he is and what they are and how they're not gonna just welcome him with open arms. I mean, even in movies like E.T., you still have a, a government that is that, uh, what you assume is gonna be hostile towards the alien species. And I don't necessarily think that that's a far off idea. When you look at how um, essentially nations are treat other, uh, people of other countries and other cultures and races, um, they're obviously a person can be um, very empathetic and very welcoming, but oftentimes nations are not. And particularly folks from other countries are scapegoated um, for that very reason in terms of awful things that happen to uh, the current residents of that nation. Now, um, I further think about this when I, when I look at the sequel, <laughs> Now, granted, I know a lot of folks did not like that movie, uh, Batman versus Superman, um, but I find the shot so iconic because here we are in the sequel to the first film where Superman has essentially just saved the planet from his own race, essentially rejecting his own people and siding with his home on Earth. And the kind of anti-alien, you know, hysteria has run rampant and essentially this is how he's welcomed when he see, considers, you know, actually speaking to Congress. And the shot is so wild to me because this is this could easily be anything that happens now. Now, I grant not everybody was hostile towards him, and we could argue that um, the hysteria was essentially um, trumpeted up by Lex Luthor if you've seen the film. But uh, they don't necessarily ever see him as someone that is like them. There's no kind of Star Trek kind of first contact moment where, you know, one, one species acknowledges the, uh, the essentially existence of the other species as an equal. And they kind of unite and create this 
kind of like futuristic, you know, socialistic project of the Federation that we see in Star Trek. What we see is that they constantly see him as something else. Even in this shot, shot here where he saves a, a child from burning fire, they think that it's something magical. They think that anything that is somewhere else has to be essentially fulfilling their religious ideology, that he must be some type of savior. Um, so we don't necessarily see aliens as actually a, 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 a friend of ours or even uh, a fellow species in the universe, but as something else. Now, uh, the one that I like to think about too, in terms of like how, how would you imagine aliens living among us? And I guess the most kind of like flushed out kind of thing in pop culture in terms of having aliens live on our planet would probably be men in black. But this really great scene where Tommy Lee Jones talks to Will Smith and, and basically just kind of settles him into the idea that, you know, aliens have always essentially been here. You know, he says this great quote that a person is smart, but people are dumb, panicky, dangerous animals, and you know it. Now, granted, I'm not uh, endorsing that, that quote from the movie, but it's a very logical kind of assessment to the hysteria that you see in other films. And in reality, the only reason why the aliens kind of live comfortably on Earth in the Men in Black universe is because nobody knows about them. And it's like, no matter what, the government has to step in and essentially police the knowledge and attention and the hysteria, essentially, of the people on Earth. Now, how do we get to that point, right? I mean, nobody wants to be in a situation where we're like, you know, an alien shows up, a humanoid alien, of course, uh, obviously, we don't think that every species out there is going to be a humanoid one, but um, but how do we get to this point where we have multiple species across the galaxy kind of coexisting? Um, well, I would think, honestly, to this great scene in uh, Star Trek II, Wrath of Khan, where we essentially see um, Spock essentially decentralizing himself, right? Every time we see these kind of alien species portrayed, humans are essentially centered, right? And there's a, there's, sometimes there's some empathy, sometimes there's a lack of empathy, but it's always this idea that like, humans are at the center of the universe, which is ironic because particularly in these fictional universes, you essentially are not, it's showing you that you're not the center of the universe uh, as a species. Um, but showing empathy for other races and other cultures is how we get to that point where we can, if someday that we do get to meet, you know, some type of other species, and it is humanoid in some way, that we're not the center, but essentially partners um, with them as in our existence. So uh, thank you guys for joining me on this little discussion. There's so many more things that I wanted to address, um, but obviously we have a very short period of time and I can only talk about so many movies. Um, but uh, thank you so much. All right, Matt. All right, Ricardo. Okay, so first, what made you, so obviously you are a one of the larger sci-fi buffs that I know and that Nerd Knight knows. Uh, why did you choose this topic? How did you finally get to this one in the first place? Well, um, for me personally, I mean, I'm, I'm a cinephile, if I, if I can use that word. Uh, I'm definitely a cinephile. Yeah. I've, I've studied film since I was in middle school. Uh, I've, I've worked on them. I've, I've worked behind the scenes, in front of the camera. I just, I just love movies. It's my favorite thing to do. And I like, you know, I always go back to this idea that I don't think that um, we should always just kind of have these kind of vapid critiques of films like, oh, this is great. Oh, this sucked. You know, like I like to just kind of dig in why, you know, and there's a lot of movies that I can argue that aren't very good, but there are things about them that I like. For example, Batman versus Superman. I don't think it was a arguably great film at all but I did like the score. I liked some of the ideas that were presented in it. And when I was kind of revis recently revisiting Man of Steel, I, I just really loved this idea of, of, of showing Superman in this kind of first contact narrative that how would humans react if he was there? Now granted, that's the whole point of the story. It's layered into the, into the narrative where the reason why uh, his father doesn't want him to show himself to the world is because he doesn't believe the world will accept him. And to some degree, He's right. And uh, the sequel to the film and Batman's response to him essentially validates Jonathan Kent's ideas about the world. 
How does this relate in general to the idea of the other, whether it's men, men versus women, black versus white, liberal versus conservative, does this have a similar analogy to any of those scenarios? Um, I think it does, but I mean, I guess, again, I think it, it's, it says, if you see that in it, I mean, you know, some things are more obvious and some are kind of layered in there, you know, but if you see it, uh, if you see that it says more about you than it does about the work. And for me, there definitely is that. And I look at, you know, something like Star Trek in that universe. And, you know, it's not like this joke, you know, like Star Trek is not meant to be like, oh, ha ha, everybody's working together. And, you know, ironically, it doesn't work out. It's like, no, the whole point of Star Trek is a show like, hey, if we actually work together and, you know, kind of get past our like more kind of topical petty differences that like, this is where we could be. Like, this is, this is us working together. I mean, that was essentially Gene Roddenberry's vision. And so I look at that and I say, wow, this, this could happen. Like, I'd love to have this federation. Now, granted, I don't want a federation that's, you know, oppressing Klingons and, and uh, you know, full of corruption and that, that kind of thing. But the idea of like different species and different races and cultures working together, you know, solving problems, you know, eradicating diseases, you know, they don't have the common cold, you know, hopefully there's no COVID you know, 2023 and, and, you know, Star Trek or whatever, you know, like, this is what we could solve if, if we work together. And I, I like to kind of think that a lot of these science fiction um, pieces are allowing us to kind of, you know, look past our problems and get to that point. Being the file that you are, how have you been doing the last six months with the uh, very limited number of uh, releases? Matt, I was in a deep depression. You don't understand. I go to the movies so much. Like before they had subscriptions to films, I was just spending lots of money going all the time. Because for me, once you once you understand film as a, as a true art form, you don't want to see it outside of the way the filmmakers want, intended it to be seen, right? So like, I don't want to watch it on like a you know a thirty inch TV. I want to see it on the big screen. And it's not just for like the tent poles. Obviously the you know, the, the high art, you know, stuff of like Christopher Nolan, you know, that kind of blockbuster stuff. You want to see it on IMAX or whatever. But even if it's something like, you know, uh, you know, Terrence Malick or Bombac or whoever, like, like you want to see it the way they intended it with the full sound, you want no distractions. So not being able to go to the movies was like really rough for me. And I'm not just being, I was, I mean, I'm, I'm not just being a uh, flippant. Like, are you, are you rough. able to, uh, what is the, the theater situation in Central Florida these days? Well, they're back open here. I know um, the, the, the two major markets, New York and LA, are still shut down. Um, but uh, most, most other cities are actually open. They're open here. I think they're at like, you know, they do like 50% capacity with the social distancing. You know, uh, I did go to see Tenet, spoiler alert. Um, but I waited until <laughs> it was like nobody in the theater. I'm still very cautious about the, you know, obviously about being in certain spaces. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it was rough, man. I love films and I love seeing them. I don't want to just watch them on TV or, you know, in, in the house or on the phone and stuff like that on my computer. I want to see it in the big screen, you know? So. What was it? Okay. I'll, I'll ask on behalf of everyone. What was it like being in the theater? That sounds. Well, a theater uh, with nobody in it. That was phenomenal. Kind of... Uh, I'm, 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 I mean, I'm being a little exaggerating. I'm exaggerating a little bit. There was like two of the other people, my girlfriend and I were there. Um, there was like a few other people there, but I mean, for a large theater has like a hundred seats and have like eight people, that's heaven for me. So I love it. Uh, that sounds that sounds nice. Here, uh, yeah, here in New York, we're still a couple of weeks away, and I've also never been to a theater with a hundred seats that has less than ninety-five people in them. So eight <laughs> people in the theater yeah. sound it, it sounds delightful. The flip side to this is that you know most people don't really go to the movies that often anyway unless there's like a big tent pole and then now with the you know the the pandemic people are concerned about being in certain spaces so on the flip side it works for people like me because nobody wants to go so it's empty so <laughs> I'm, i think it's great so everything's coming up ricardo yeah this is you know things are finally turning around for me this is great. <laughs> 2020 is the best all right, cool. Okay, so um, thanks. That was delightful as always. Um, and for everyone who's watching and or watching the recording, um, I've also just on, on the side, I've been 
telling Ricardo for at least three years now that he needs to run for mayor in Orlando or governor of Florida oh, uh, he still has rebuffed my best intentions. So if any of <laughs> you apply pressure, I, uh, him, so I, 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 I that, that is, I, you, you know, that's very sweet of you to say, and I always appreciate that. Uh, but I will tell you this, you know, there's many ways for us to participate in the political process. And obviously I'll be participating this November. Uh, and uh, I hope everybody listening participates as well. Sometimes, you know, you got to step up, you know, but if a bunch of mats showed up in my door and said, we want you to do it, if the people wanted it, I would do it. You know, no questions asked, but. Uh, All right, I'm gonna, that's a, I'm, mom, gonna, so. I'm gonna call you on that and I'm gonna get a bunch of people to uh, get on your doorstep by the end of the <laughs> week, by next week, great. <laughs> oh, thank you. Okay, right, well, uh, you go guys. ahead, kill your screen sharing, Ricardo. Uh, we're gonna pass it over to the crew at uh, Nerd Night San Diego. Um, so a little background about why we're doing this entire uh, series here um, is that actually there was, uh, uh, so we wanted to do a whole, uh, generally a lot of space theme presentations uh, this month. We thought it'd be a, a fun way to uh, get some outside eyeballs here. And so uh, Robert's going to talk a little bit about uh, what's happening in, uh, in San Diego at Nerd Night. Uh, he's new to the Nerd Night family as a, uh, a co-boss down there. Um, but also then he's going to uh, turn this over to uh, Francis and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, with him who actually uh, worked with many of the original Mercury astronauts. So uh, this is, you're going to be dazzled, you're going to be delighted by someone who is there on the ground doing the real work. So uh, Robert, go ahead and, um, talk and take it away and pass it over to Francis too when you need to. Thank you, Matt. Uh, greetings, everybody from San Diego. We are the home of the fish tacos, the San Diego Zoo. And I can say this as of today, officially now with 40% less wildfire. Uh, we can all take a round of applause. San Diego just put out its uh, big raging wildfire, at least got it contained. Uh, I am the host of Nerd Night San Diego, comedian archaeologist Robert Timothy. I'm one of the co-bosses, along with my co-boss, Zed. And I'm super excited to be here tonight, not just because I didn't die in a bent metal tube like a water slide at the age of 13. Uh, what an amazing presentation that was. That is fantastic. I don't know. Francis got a lot to follow on that one, but uh, he's pretty good. I think he can do it. Uh, Nerd Night San Diego is around five years old now. I've been around about two and a half of those years and taking over just the beginning of this year. We've been really lucky to be one of the world's biotechnology and telecom hubs with three major research universities, numerous private scientific organizations like the Scripps Institute, major scientific museums like the Ruben H. Fleet, and the best California burritos on earth we have had a vibrant nerd night community down here. So in one of the few bright sides of this pandemic, we were able to transition well from to an all digital nurture, virtual nerd night pretty quickly and successfully. And we now regularly host our monthly virtual nerd nights with triple digit audience numbers, which we're really proud of. One of the reasons we are able to generate so much interest in this wide variety of speakers is the wide variety of speakers we get to host. We get everybody from medieval sword fighters in full armor fighting each other uh, to cannabis scientists quest to prove that THC is the least interesting psychoactive chemical in marijuana to one scientist startling, this startling look at the seriously corrupt underbelly of the for-profit scientific publishing industry. Looking at you, nature. Uh, your next speaker, however, is a standout even among them and a San Diego Nerd Night favorite and one of our highest reviewed speakers of all time. This speech, The First Spacefarers by Nerd Night veteran Fa Francis French, will recount the stories of the Mercury astronauts and their dangerous missions they flew. I mean, first human spaceflight program, what could go wrong, right? And now it's mine and San Diego Nerd Night's honor to present Francis French. Thank you so much, Robert. I really appreciate that introduction, which I'm not going to be able to live up to at all, I'm afraid. Uh, Ricardo, I got an answer for you here in San Diego to your movie dilemma, which is the revival of the great American drive-in. It's working really well here. You've got, if you've got a good stereo system in your car, it's so much better than anything any theater could do. But um, absolutely, I want to share with you some stuff today um, about the very first astronauts, which is probably one of the most dangerous things that anybody's ever done. Um, can you see my share screen? I hope you can at this point. Um, until they were selling tickets for Action Park, by the sound of it, this is probably the most dangerous thing that anybody had ever done. This was uh, a, a risky thing, the very first people to go in space. Um, this is based on a book I wrote, you can see on the screen here, Into That Silent Sea, uh, which was, I got the opportunity to work with each of the Mercury astronauts that went into orbit. So that was, uh, I got to hear a lot of personal stories. 
which would take hours to just to tell the best ones. And we have about 18 minutes. So I'm going to give you a real quick overview of some of these people and what they were like. Um, with the uh, advent of the space race back in 1957, America really realized that uh, it was in a fight with the Soviet Union. This was a fight for global supremacy. And it was clear the next thing after the very first satellite in space was going to be the first people. And the question was, how do you choose these first people? There have been astronauts in science fiction. We've just heard about some great science fiction movies. But what do you do when you're going to choose the real people? How do you fill a job description, something that's never existed in human history before, because it's never been possible before? So both countries, both the Soviet Union and America, and I'm just going to talk about America today, started looking into how to choose these people. Now, this is a point where the doctors, the psychologists, the psychiatrists all get involved, and they start talking about what might happen to somebody when they go into space. One of their worries was that somebody gets into space, they're looking out at the infinite vastness of the universe. They're looking into, into forever, essentially. Would they go crazy? Would their mind not be able to take in this infinite, infinite vastness? We know that's not the case because we do it a lot here. It's called nighttime. It's really easy to do. You look up at the stars, you're seeing it. But you know psychiatrists, you know psychologists, you know doctors, they often want to write an academic paper. If you're writing a paper, you want to have something a little bit provocative. So a lot of doctors and a lot of psychoanalysts made a lot of time going, what's going to happen to these people? We really need stable people. Other doctors, more physical based doctors were saying, well, what happens if somebody's floating in zero gravity? Maybe their heart is going to stop beating. Maybe their lungs will float inside them and not be able to work anymore. Maybe their eyeballs will float somehow in a way that they're not going to be able to see. Once again, as a little kid, we've all hung upside down, which is not only zero gravity, it's, it's a little bit more. It's one gravity the other way around. Nothing happens to people. Everybody's fine. But there was this worry, and there were a lot of doctors making a lot of fuss about what might happen to the human body. So how do you choose somebody who is going to be able to do this stuff, and you're not going to know what happens to them until they get into space? So people looked at all kinds of extreme jobs. They looked at mountain climbers, they looked at sea divers, they looked at adventurers. They thought, where can we find people who've been in extreme situations? And they actually did look at people like circus performers, people on like trampolines, trapeze artists, people that were able to flip and roll and tumble in space. Sounds silly now, but it actually makes a lot of sense. Somebody very, very good at extreme sticks might actually be somebody who could survive well in space. But that's the direction America's space program went in the end. What they chose to go with were military test pilots for lots of different reasons. These are the kind of people who they have a lot of experience doing something really dangerous and something really technical at the same time, which is a pretty unusual job description. Not only are you flying a state of the art jet, the crash could explode, could kill you at any second because it's brand new. But while you're flying it, you're going to make very delicate measurements and tell the ground what's going on with them. And if something starts going wrong, your job might be to die. But as you're dying, as you're about to hit the ground, you're the one saying, I'm experiencing this. My controls are telling me this. You don't panic. You do your job right up to the end. So these are people who had a very high tolerance for a very, very risky profession. And they knew that was part of what they wanted to do. They chose it willingly. So it meant maybe to choose these military pilots. And the other side of it too was they all had these security clearances. They all had this way that they were going to go into a very technological secret program. They were oriented for all that kind of stuff. They had a lot in common. You can tell they're all about the same height because they're all going to get into a relatively small spacecraft. They're all about the same age. They're all about the same kind of physical build. Something else you probably notice right away, they're all white men. Now that's something NASA never put any ethnicity, any gender requirements on its application. It's we need people who have these qualifications. The trouble was, if you were a military test pilot, you were a white man because the Air Force did not accept anybody else apart from white men. A couple of people who were not white but had not, got, not been allowed to get to the kind of levels where they were at the, ex at the elite, these guys. So it was a selecting group. It was uh, not what we would see today. And thank goodness the world has changed. Um, there have been a lot of women go through test pilot school and other places since, plus fly in space for a lot of other qualifications they might have. But at this time, we're looking at 1959, very, very different kind of America from the America we see today, which is continuing to change. But something else happened at this point, which NASA was not expecting. And these seven people who got chosen were really not expecting. 
they thought, okay, this is a little bit different from our usual career, but it's just another high performance space vehicle, airplane, kind of the same. We're going to be flying something different. But they became national heroes. This was not something that was in had ever been able to do before. This is not something NASA was anticipating. The reason was this was the Cold War. This was a time when the Soviet Union and America were fighting each other, but they were fighting each other through propaganda. They were fighting each other through headlines. This was the first time in history where both countries had a, a weapon that could not be used essentially. The nuclear weapon, you did not want to use it because nobody would win. So for the first time, people were fighting, but they got to fight different ways. So having a propaganda war was a good way of doing it. These guys are going to be flying a single-seater spacecraft. There's no operational reason for seven people to put on a spacesuit at the same time on the same day. But why do they take this picture? Because it makes for a great photo. You saw this on the front of Time magazine, Life magazine, and more importantly, magazines all over the world. This was the kind of thing that America was going to use these guys for. They almost look like medieval knights in their silvery suits of armor getting ready to go into battle, which they kind of were. The trouble is, if you look a little closer at this picture, it's not quite as surprisingly great as it looks. If you kind of look in the bottom right corner, you can see that blue roll of papers kind of been torn a little bit and covered up. This is like a really bad high school sports picture where they've got the bench, they got the roll of blue paper, and they just kind of stuck it there. If you look at the boots in the front row as well, you'll see that some are very silvery and, and the, the two middle ones are not. That's because they didn't have enough spacesuit boots to go around. So they took a couple of pairs of black boots, spray painted them silver for this picture. So they're kind of like putting this together as they go here. It wasn't quite as technologically amazing as it looked, but it made for a great picture. And as I mentioned, it got on the front of all these magazines. So who were these guys? Let me tell you briefly about each of them and who they were. First guy here, the first American to fly in space, Alan Shepard. You probably never heard of him. And that is something that really, really annoyed Alan Shepard because he was expecting to go into the history books as the first person ever to fly in space. Now, if you think of the tens of thousands, the hundreds of thousands of years that people imagine flying to the moon, flying to the stars, all the science fiction stories that go back to the ancient Greek times and before that, the amount of time between the first person in space and the second person ended up being three weeks. So Alan Shepard lost his chance to be to the history books by three weeks. And that's because Yuri Gagarin from the Soviet Union ended up becoming the first person in space through a secret program that just beat America into space. So Alan Shepard was kind of disappointed and uh, didn't get his shot. But in a way, he had the last laugh because 10 years later on Apollo 14, he's the only one of these seven people who gets to walk on the moon. That's him in the spacesuit right there. The second guy who goes up, Gus Grissom, um, he did pretty much what Alan Shepard did. He, it was a very simple mission they had. They both had a very, very unpowerful rocket that could basically get them high enough to say they were in space, but not powerful enough to stay there. It was a straight up 15 minute up and down lob, um, a really, really basic thing to do. Gus Grissom did the same thing, splashed down in the ocean. His hatch blew and all of a sudden the spacecraft filled with water. He got out in time, but it sank to the bottom of the ocean and it sat there for 38 years. You can now go to Kansas and see it in a museum because as you see, kind of like those pictures that when they found the Titanic, the same thing happened with the spacecraft. They were able to find it after 38 years at the bottom of the ocean. And in a weird way, that 15 minute flight is way less impressive than the fact they could find this thing way, way deeper than the Titanic, bring it up, restore it, and you can now go look at it in a museum. Gus Grissom had an unfortunate career. He was able to fly the very first Gemini mission, the two person spacecraft that followed Mercury. He was about to command the Apollo 1 mission, which would have been the first of the three-person Apollo missions. In 1967, he and his crew were sitting on the pad a few weeks before the planned launch, testing the spacecraft. There's a fire inside the spacecraft, and they can't get out in time. So Gus Grissom died in that spacecraft along with his two spacefaring friends and became the first of the seven to die, just to showing again how dangerous a business this was. The third American in space you've probably heard of, John Glenn. And a lot of people think he was the first American in space, but he wasn't. He was number three. Why is he so famous? A couple of reasons. He was the first American to orbit the Earth. America had finally managed to test a rocket powerful enough to not only send somebody into space, but powerful enough to help the spacecraft stay there. So John Glenn was able to orbit the Earth and really begin to catch up with the Russians. But there was something else about John Glenn. We, we talk a lot about heroes. We talk a lot about people who have impeccable characters and normally you know that you read about heroes and then it turns out they've done something scandalous in their life and it all comes crashing down. John Glenn, that never happened to him. In his 90 years 
more than 90 years on this planet, he, uh, he met his wife when they were in kindergarten and stayed married to her until he died age 90 something. He was uh, a, a Marine, he was a astronaut, he became a congressman, had a very, very good career. He ran for president. Even in his 90s, he was running a public policy institute. His entire life essentially was in public service. And you can see from photos like this, this is kind of in the slightly pre Beatlemania times. This is the kind of poster that might end up on some teenager's wall. This is the kind of propaganda that America really wanted going around the world because this guy actually lived up to that all American apple pie image that America was trying to do. He was the real deal. He continued to be the real deal. And very luckily at the end of his uh, senatorial career around 1994, he was able to fly in space one more time at the age of 77, he got to fly on the space shuttle one more time, which was a, a great capstone to a career. Scott Carpenter was the uh, second American in orbit to follow him. And Scott was essentially chosen because he was in supreme physical condition. He was a test pilot too, but with all those doctors not knowing what might happen to somebody, they were uh, very concerned about what the human body might do. So selecting a test pilot who was in really, really good physical condition was a great idea. But Scott had another aspect to him, um, was he was very, very curious about stuff. He got into space and he wanted to look and investigate and do science experiments and see what the environment of space was like. He also had an intermittently malfunctioning spacecraft, which wasn't able to get him on his proper reentry course. He ended up splashing down a couple of hundred miles away from where he wanted to be. Um, he was kind of an, a, an outlier in that time because the mission controllers at the time said, it's all great and good to be curious, but we just want somebody who's going to listen to us on the radio and do exactly what we tell them at that exact second. We don't really want them to be quite so much in command yet until we've had a few more flights under our belt. So Scott Carpenter, unfortunately, got sort of leave it out of the program a little bit at that point. He ended up doing some other amazing stuff. He went back to the US Navy. He lived on the bottom of the ocean in an undersea habitat, becoming the first astronaut and aquanaut in history. Wally Shira, on the other hand, got the next uh, flight and he was a consummate test pilot. He was the kind of guy who was gonna follow things exactly to the letter, exactly what Mission Control wanted him to do. Basically, he got into space and allowed his spacecraft to drift, so he hardly used any fuel at all, basically to show that that was doable, that you could actually use very, very little fuel in space and fly around up there. He was the only astronaut to fly the Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo program. He flew one Gemini mission, and then he stepped into the shoes of his dead friend, Gus Grissom, to take over that very first Apollo mission and flew that very first mission. So he was the only guy to get to do all of those. Gordon Cooper got the very last of the Mercury missions. I, I love this picture and the over overuse of the dry ice they have here. It looks like he's just joined Motley Crue for the week or something. It's ridiculous, but I love it. And Gordon Cooper was kind of the kid of the program. He was the youngest one. And also because of his diff slightly different test piloting and test engineering experience, he was a little looked down on by the others. This is a group of elite guys. So um, to be looked down on just means you're absolutely amazing rather than absolutely, absolutely amazing. They looked at him and kind of pushed him to the end and he got that last mission, but that meant that he got the longest mission. He got a day and a half mission. He actually got something that was really impressive, probably one of the toughest missions. He got up there and those spacecraft were so primitive that his own perspiration, the, the, the amount of moisture that built up in that spacecraft was enough to probably short out the electrical systems. It's that primitive. So he's flying a spacecraft. All of a sudden, some of the circuit breakers go down. He's going to have to fly this thing manually back to Earth, which nobody else had done before. Not only does he manage to do that perfectly and splash down in the ocean, he splashes down closer to his target point than any of the other astronauts before him who had the full ability of a working spacecraft. So he really proved himself on that one. He proved any doubts were out of the window. He went on to fly a Gemini mission as well, and he ended up being a backup commander on Apollo mission, had a, a, another really interesting career. So that was the end of the six flights of the Mercury program, but I mentioned there were seven guys. So what happened to this last guy? And who is this last guy? Deke Slayton was the seventh of the seventh. Deke Slayton was supposed to fly the second of those missions, the one that was ended up flying, but he had a very, very minor heart issue. Um, it, it basically a slightly over the heartbeat. Nothing that would him out from anything else, but it was enough for the doctors who, as I mentioned, were really over eager about this stuff to say, look, if you've got other guys without you, fly them instead. So Deke Slayton sat on the ground and became the chief astronaut working in the office, being the boss of all the others, but wasn't getting to fly. It took him 10 years to overturn that medical um, decision, at which point you can see he's a lot older at this point. But in 1985, the last Apollo mission, 
went into space and they docked with the Russians, the very first uh, international space mission. So Deke Slayton, after being 59, finally gets to fly once in 1975. So I was very, very lucky to work with all those guys um, over time. I, I put all that information into this book, into that silent sea. I've also put a lot of that stuff onto um, my website, francisfrench.com, which you can see right there. And uh, I hope that gave you a very, very quick look into these really fascinating characters in history. All right, sorry, sorry for the delay there. And uh, Robert, you can hop in as well if you like. Um, great. I, that was delightful. And we've got a bunch of uh, questions as to be expected. So uh, I'll start out with Malin first. So if Carpenter splashed down a couple hundred miles away, how was is, how is he recovered? Where did the uh, retrieval craft or retrieval ship come from? That's a great question. In those early days, they had um, the Navy had recovery craft all over the world. These guys even did jungle survival training, desert survival training, in case they came down somewhere else in the world. Um, they were able to keep his signal coming down all the way, so they knew where he'd splashed down, and they were able to send a ship pretty quickly. The trouble was for the public is they didn't tell Walter Cronkite, who was essentially the trusted voice of America's media at the time. So Walter Cronkite is over-dramatizing it on television, saying you know, America may have just lost its first astronaut. In the meantime, NASA and the Navy are going, no, no, he's right there. We know where he is. Just give us a second. We'll tell you. So um, the great thing was the spacecraft was shaped where it could reorient itself and come in through the atmosphere. So even though it was slightly off angle from what they wanted to do, it righted itself and came back down. So it proved the spacecraft was incredibly versatile. No matter how primitive it was, it could survive. Uh, how many times have you been to Kennedy or Johnson Space Centers? <laughs> I, I've had the great delight of actually being out to the, the launch facilities out there in Florida and the, um, where the astronauts train in Houston a number of times are being paid to do so, which is the best bit. And when, you're, when your hobby becomes something that you actually get to do in person, it's wonderful um, to be able to get into the simulators that the astronauts use and, and to actually do some of that stuff. What really went, came through my mind when I'm, I'm in the same spaceflight simulators these astronauts are doing and I'm crashing and burning within the first 10 seconds is you realize how good they are because it's really, really difficult. It looks great in a movie. It looks great on TV. It looks like, oh, yeah, I could do that. And then you just lose it in the first few seconds. You go, nope, these are very special people with very, very special um, abilities. But as you can tell, the technology is just the grounding for what I'm interested in. I'm, I'm fascinated by the human stories. And now there's been over 500 people have been in space from almost every country in the world of almost every ethnicity, gender. I just wrote an article about the first gay astronauts. It's a really interesting time to, to see how, just as, uh, as Ricardo was talking about, movies are reflecting society in the same way current astronauts are reflecting a very different world from seven white men in 1959. Sure. So speaking of that sort of humanistic approach to uh, space travel, uh, one, another question from the Cheddar is asking, how are the Mercury 7 vetted for morals or politics? Was there, were there sort of soft skills in the evaluation? There was. Um, they, when they became military um, officers, there was a lot of vetting went on through that. There was also when they were, went through the astronaut selection process, they were also tested a lot physically. Basically, um, John Glenn described it. Imagine any orifice in the body that somebody could put something in, go as deep as you can into that hole, and that's what they did to us. They basically was the most intense medical testing on totally healthy people that's ever been done, they think. Um, and most of it turned out to be completely unnecessary because it turned out it was a lot easier to fly in space than they thought. They just didn't know. When it came to the physical side of things, when it came to the personal side of things, these were all guys who were married with kids, um, at a time when you pretty much had to have that for your Air Force career anyway. Um, as the program went on, as you get into the 70s, um, you see a lot of these guys who are holding marriages together, basically saying, will you, will you please stay married to me because I can fly to the moon if you, if you do. And if you divorce me, I probably can't. The first time an astronaut divorced in the early 70s and, and got to fly after that, then almost everybody divorced because it was like, oh, I can keep my career and I can do this. Wow. Yeah, it, it's, so there's a lot of interesting social changes as time went on that I've really um, enjoyed writing about as well. Francis, we have, actually uh, have a question some from, of the, the, uh, from the San Diego group, if that's okay, Matt. 
one of the ones you, one of the ones you mentioned was the Sputnik, or one of the ones you mentioned was that Russia was able to get uh, a man in space earlier than us in a what was considered like a blitzkrieg secret project. This was during the Cold War when we were observing everything we possibly could to look for nuclear detonations and Russian technology. How did they get us get this past us, and how did they beat us by that narrow margin where they clearly knew our timeline and we didn't know theirs? That was the key. They knew exactly what America was doing. America chose to do this freely and openly, which meant that every time somebody was delayed, it looked really bad on the newspapers. The Russians, on the other hand, had a launch site deep, deep, deep into their country on a secret base that was surrounded by other things. They even changed the name of the town to pretend it was a different town. Um, America could tell when something had been launched on a radar as it came over the horizon. But until that moment, unless you had something deep inside the Soviet Union, which they didn't, you could, didn't really know they were going to launch something until they did. The, the ability for satellites to take pictures from space didn't exist before we launched the satellites. So this was a, a brand new technology. Um, the, the thing about the Russians, the, the reason they were able to beat America into the first person in space is because they were less technologically um, advanced. It's, it's a weird irony. America was able to build tiny nuclear weapons. Russia had to build huge ones. They didn't have microcircuitry. They were building things with valve tubes and stuff, which was 10, 15 years behind America. So if you've got a tiny nuclear weapon and you want to launch it somewhere, you build a small rocket. If you have an enormous one and you want to launch it at America, you have to build a big rocket. So ironically, Russia had enormous rockets. And that meant they could send people and much bigger space, heavier spacecraft into space ahead of America. It's one of those weird things where being behind actually puts you ahead briefly. All right, uh, that's that's fascinating. I'm gonna I'm gonna remember that one for uh, for my next uh, dinner party, whenever we can have dinner parties again. Um, all right, so last question. I want to know, uh, can you talk about some of the female astronauts with whom you've uh, interviewed or interacted with? Absolutely. Um, I got to work for Sally Ride. She was my boss for a number of years, and she's America's first woman in space. Um, that, that counts. She, la <laughs> she launched in uh, 1983. Now, you have to go back into the early 60s to find the first woman who flew in space. That was Valentina Tereshkova of the Soviet Union. That was a huge propaganda coup for the Russians because they could say, look, the Soviet Union is so far ahead of America. You, you don't even allow women to be jet pilots. And here we are sending a woman into space. It made huge, huge headlines. The trouble was Russia did not then launch another woman for another 20 years until Sally Ride was about to go. And then they did quickly made her number three instead of number two. They really had no um, interest in equality of gender in, in doing that. But it was a great one-off propaganda coup. And I got to talk to Valentina a lot about that. Um, sat in some bars in New Jersey with the first woman in space, which was wonderful. Because uh, these were people who'd been in the Soviet Union growing up. And even when they became famous, they were very constrained by what they were allowed to say and not say. So to be able to talk to the Russians and to interview them when the Soviet Union has fallen, and I've been able to read some reports about what actually happened and, and ask them questions, and they'd be like, oh, you know about that. Well, let me have another drink and let me tell you. That was great. But um, yeah, very, very different um, NASA, a very, very different world now where we see women um, who've commanded the space station. They've, they've flown the space shuttle, commanded the space shuttle. In fact, you hear the current NASA administrator talking about Americans going back to the moon. He's saying we're going to send the next Americans and the first woman to the moon. It's part of the original sentence where he's talking about going back to the, the moon is women are in that sentence. That is so far away from the 1950s and 60s. And it's, it's a wonderful change. When you, uh, when you first got to talk to Valentina, I'm assuming that was post 1989 or is that somehow before uh, the wall fell? Yeah, there was a wonderful moment um, after 1989 and before Putin essentially where all the archives opened and you could get everything. And then the Russians learned how to be even better capitalists than anybody else. And then they were like, oh, you want to read that? Well, give us this money. And then we can, all of a sudden, they managed to monetize everything. But for a, a, a nice little kind of almost a decade in there, I was able to get lots of archive stuff and talk to lots of different people and get some really, really interesting information. But the human stories, the, the bar stories, if you like, those, those have continued. And yes, talking to Valentina after the the, uh, after the end of communism was a very, very different um, experience from those I understand who got to talk to her before where her answers were very, very scripted. Sure. 
All right. Thank you so much. This was, as, as we predicted, utterly fascinating. And I wish we could have you on here for two hours um, every single Sunday night for the rest of the month. Um, but we'll we have will that dinner party sometime. I, uh, ne next time I'm in uh, San Diego and we aren't, uh, we, are, we are allowed to do that, I'm, I'm looking you up immediately. You're the first person I'm, uh, I'm going to track down. Cool. Thanks so much. All right. So, uh, Rachel, go ahead and fire up your webcam and your mic now. I uh, want to introduce Rachel. Uh, the boss of Nerd Night DC, and she's uh, like Ricardo. She's going to use the platform for uh, herself, and we're going to do a fun little uh, sort of bookend for the day. We obviously started out the stream a couple of uh, or an hour and a half ago with uh, the wild, crazy tale of a wild action park, and now we're going to uh, wrap things up uh, this evening with a wild story of uh, wine empires built during Prohibition about the gallows and the Franzias and uh, some others. So. Uh, Rachel, just now we're actually seeing a blink white screen, yeah. so maybe you stop and restart your uh, screen there. There we go. That, that looks better. There we go. Yep. Okay. I'll, all right, over to you. Take it away. Awesome. Hi, everyone. So, as Matt said, I'm Rachel Pendergrass. I am one of the co bosses of Nerd Night DC, although I've done Nerd Nights in other cities, and I love all of you so much. The story I have for you today is one of my all time favorites. It includes murder, it includes mystery. It includes mediocre wines that you buy for under $10 and bring to a party because you don't want to spend more money than that. It's about the Gallo family. So you've almost definitely had a Gallo wine at some point in your life, <clears throat> or at the very least, you've been in the same room as one. Uh, these are all Gallo wines. Uh, it's pretty much your standard grocery store or gas station shelf, right? These are all Gallo properties as well. So according to the official story of Gallo Winery. Uh, it was founded in 1933 by two brothers who just after Prohibition ended wanted to get into winemaking but didn't know anything about wine. And so they went to the Modesto County Library and they found two pamphlets that contained information and they used those two pamphlets to grow an empire that survives today, which Technically, I think all of that is true, but it like just drastically misrepresents the actual start of the company and what the company became. Um, so what's the real story? Uh, the real story is- Actually, Rachel, yeah, hop, hop in for one second. If it's, up to, it's totally up to you, but we're also seeing, uh, we're seeing half, uh, half slides, half your speaker notes. On oh, those. yeah, no, oh. okay. Um, it's sorry a, about that. Let me no worries. magic. Zoom magic, how do you work? Your speaking notes are very detailed. They're very, very detailed. Um, okay, hold on. I'm so sorry. I do uh, not, this is why Nerd Night DC went on hiatus is because I don't understand this world. Uh, that's fine. In the, in the meantime, I will, uh, I will sadly admit to the uh, crowd watching, whoops, sorry about that, uh, that I'm not drinking Franzia or Gallo right now um, in, my, in my blue glass. Uh, so everyone who is uh, drinking, let us know in the chat area what you are drinking at this exact moment. Because obviously that is uh, critical to Nerd Night. Chris Adams, if you're still watching, what are you drinking? You always seem to have a pretty nice uh, virtual wine feast uh, going on. So maybe you're, uh, you're the one drinking for the rest of the group, at least. And Zed, what are you drinking? What are you drinking in San Diego right now? I think Zed might be drinking a, a red wine also. But it's good that we're trying to uh, make sure everyone stays nice and hydrated throughout all of this. There, that should be. Oh, look at that. Uh, oh, wait, but hold on. Now I can't see my speaker notes. Oh, do I want to do this talk without notes? The so field. sorry, guys. Oh, that's all right. You're an expert. Rose with said, ah, Boda Box. Uh, Boda Box is good. Uh, that for a while, um, that was my go-to for about a year. Although, you know, I'm not a huge wine drinker, I'm more of a beer person, but, you know, having the, what is it? What's a box, three and a half or four bottles of wine for the price of one and a half. So that's usually a, a tough one there to beat. Go. Okay, starting again. Um, <laughs> okay, so these are all Gallo wines, which apparently some of you are drinking, A+. plus. Uh, you get, you get extra credit points for that, for sure. So the real story of the Gallows is a little bit darker than this cute American dream story that they present. Um, 
Ernest was around six years old when he went to live with his parents and his younger brother, Julio, in Oakland. They were running a saloon at the time. He spent most of his childhood uh, with his maternal grandparents, and so he didn't really know the family that well, but he moved in when he was six and started getting to know them. And shortly after that, uh, Prohibition really started picking up speed. So can't have a saloon beer in Prohibition, so his parents sold it and bought a farm in Antioch. And the farm had a small vineyard. Now, it might seem like a really bad idea to buy a vineyard right before Prohibition starts, but it was actually pretty brilliant. Um, the rules of Prohibition allowed home winemakers to make up to 200 gallons for individual use, and being Italian immigrants themselves, the Gallows knew that Italians were not about to give up wine, so if they couldn't buy wine, they'd absolutely buy grapes to make wine. And so a ton of grapes that before Prohibition cost like $6 a ton, suddenly shot up to costing like $80 a ton, which in 2020 money is like over a grand. Um, <clears throat> and, and you'd think that like, hey, this is great. They're making money. They're living on a farm. The whole family's there. It's a bonding experience. Not exactly. Uh, Joe Sr., uh, Joe Gallo, the father of the family, was a little bit of a terrible human being. At this point, his wife had already filed for divorce a couple times, or tried to, because of domestic abuse, and uh, the two boys, who were you know, eight and nine when the farm started up, were working 12 to 18 hour days, and if they slowed down too much, their dad would be awful. So, uh, to add even more tension to that, about a year after they moved to Antioch, uh, their little brother, Joe Jr., is born. And Joe Jr. has the audacity to, A, be an infant so he doesn't have to work 12-hour days, uh, B, not have to be shipped off to his maternal grandparents because their parents didn't have time for him, and C, he bared his father's name, which is a high honor, and that's a bit of a slap in the face to the two kids who are literally competing to see who can work harder just to earn their dad's affection. Uh, so from the beginning, there was a bit of a chip on their shoulder against Joe Jr. Not long after Joe Jr. is born, the Antioch farm starts to fail, but in swoops a hero, uh, Joe Sr.'s brother, Mike. Mike was kind of the Al Capone of California at the time, uh, but like a little quirkier. Uh, and he had just been released from San Quentin where he was serving time for running a bunco ring. And he just had this extra farm. And he was like, hey, you guys want this farm? You can have it. I mean, you have to do something for me though. And that something was make bootleg brandy and then deliver it to the soda pop shops that were Mike's customers. And they did that and they made some money. But the, the Gallo family, at least Joe's side of the Gallo family, really wanted to follow the law, not be ethical, at least be legal. It kind of pervades through this, this story. Um, and so they got out of bootlegging and into the more legitimate trade of shipping grapes to Chicago. So Joe went with the grapes the first year and tried to sell them, but it turns out that Joe is not a people person, go figure. And so his son, Ernest, who at this point is 16, offers to go instead. And so Joe sends his 16-year-old son on a train to 1920s Chicago to sell, gun, uh, to sell grapes. He does give him a gun. Um, and it turns out that this is like Joe or Ernest's calling. Ernest is absolutely a people person. And whereas his dad struggled with making deals, oh, oh boy, was Ernest good at it. And so they're raking in money and they're raking in money. And after a few years, you know, Ernest has graduated high school. He's 19. He's seen some Chicago. He's very worldly. And so he goes to his father and he's like, hey, dude, I deserve more than $30 a month for salary, which in like 2020 money is like $400. Or at least you could give me like a share of the company. And Joe Sr. is like, absolutely not. To the point where, as the boys kept pressing uh, one time, instead of just turning them down, he just like straight up brought out a shotgun and chased them through the vineyard. That's a quote from Ernest about that incident. Um, eventually they returned to the vineyard after that. It took them a couple months to get over that moment. Uh, I'm impressed they got over it at all. 
And, and, and Ernest kind of figures out, okay, my dad doesn't actually value me as a human being and he's not gonna give me shares of the stock, but he does care about business. So what I'll do, or maybe he fell in love. It doesn't actually say, but this is my thought about his philosophy. What I'll do is I will marry the daughter of my father's business partner, Emilia Franzia. Uh, and so he marries Emilia Franzia and he goes back to his dad and he's like, my beautiful wife needs someone to provide for her. Give me shares of the company. <laughs> his dad still does not give him shares of the company. At this point, prohibition is pretty much on its way to being repealed. And uh, Ernest is ready to hit the ground running. And so he applies with the prohibition board for a bonded wine room on June 14th, 1932. On June 20th, 1942, the Prohibition Wine Board gets back to him and is like, no, see, in order to have a bonded wine room, you have to have a bonded vineyard. And in order to have a bonded vineyard, you have to have a vineyard and you don't own anything, your dad does. So the next day, now it's entirely possible that the official story on the record still is that it was really just a murder-suicide and Joe Sr. had this failing health and he was starting to look back at his life and consider himself a failure. So maybe he just like lost it and shot his wife and then himself. It's awful convenient that it happened the day after this, this prohibition board rejection. Um, either way, Ernest and Julio were not the type of sons to let mourning get in the way of business. And so two months later to the day, Ian J. Gallo Winery was founded. Now I'm sure at some point in there, they did like go to a, a, a library and read some pamphlets, but um, it's a little different than the story that they're representing. Uh, so they started right at the beginning of Prohibition and um, while all the other winemakers, once prohibition is repealed, is like, uh, they're wanting to make wine the way that they used to. They're wanting to crush the grapes, ferment the grapes, age the grapes, and then sell the grapes. The gallows are like, yeah, but I want to sell the grapes now. I do not want to wait four years to age this wine. I'm going to sell it now. And so they sell unaged wine the first year. And while all the other winemakers were clutching their pearls about tradition, the gallows raked in buckets of money. And so this sort of set up the, the flavor of the Gallo winery, right? It's, it's about giving the consumers what they want, regardless of what good wine is. And uh, you can really see that in some of the early offerings. I'm sure some of the people right now are experiencing flashbacks to some of the worst hangovers they've ever had. These are all Gallo products. Um, and one of them was kind of their first big hit, Thunderbird. The story goes that one day, uh, Ernest is, is walking around and he walks into a store and he sees on the counter there's Kool-Aid and there's lemon juice and he asks the store owner about it and the store owner admits that customers tend to like to buy their white sherry, the Gallows white sherry, and pour Kool-Aid in it or lemon juice. And instead of being horribly offended by this like pretty much any other winemaker would be, Ernest goes, oh, interesting, so that's what they want. And so he goes back to his lab and has them make a drink with that flavor profile, and that drink was Thunderbird. And it skyrocketed them to the top. Like, they were top three immediately. Um, and part of the reason was the product, but the other part of the reason was they had this business model where instead of going to wine stores and just selling wine, they would sell a service. Gallo salesmen would stock your shelves for you. And, you know, store owners didn't care if they were putting Gallo in the best spot so long as the money was still coming in and great somebody else wants to stock my shelves for me cool one less thing for me to do and the salesman did stock the shelves but they also maybe brought like brushes with grease <clears throat> to to paint on the competitors wine bottles so that they would collect more dust and look shittier They'd just tamper with things. They'd hide competitors' products. Like, it was some shady nonsense. And on top of that shady nonsense, um, they would also go into, into cities and they would throw their marketing scheme for uh, Thunderbird was, like, problematic in general. But they would throw empty Thunderbird bottles into the gutter to just increase brand awareness and make it seem like everybody was drinking Thunderbird, but you know, whatever. Regardless of how many scruples they had, um, it 
worked. And, and it wasn't until the 1970s or 80s that the FTC got onto them for those things. And even then, they didn't really fix them. They just stopped keeping records older than 30 days as a company policy. Either way, from 1948 all the way through 1955, like Gallo sales increased by 400%. They grew. Uh, in the 1960s, they were so influential that they basically picked the grape varieties that are grown in California today. They saw that people were mostly growing like what they considered lower quality grapes, mission, stuff like that. And they told the grape growers, all right, well, you can keep growing that if you want. It's totally up to you, but I'll, we're not going to buy it. And or if we do, it'll be at half price. But if you grow what we want you to grow, the way we want you to grow it, why then we'll buy it above market value. It's your choice, though. Uh, to give you an idea of how powerful they were at this era, Coke tried to get into the winemaking business in the 1970s. By 1983, they had failed so thoroughly. And, and mind you, they were specifically trying to target Gallo because Gallo, they thought, was only popular because of advertising and Coke, Coke knew advertising. By 1983, they had failed so thoroughly that they sold all of their wine holdings to Seagram's. And you can see in this chart, uh, this is the year after Coca-Cola sold to Seagram's. They are way below Gallo. Here's the year after that. Not making a lot of money. I mean, they are. They're making a lot of money, but like compared to Gallo, oof. Uh, <laughs> so this was great. Everything was going well, but there were some things that they were struggling with. They couldn't get rid of this bulk wine image, this non-quality image. They definitely weren't breaking into the premium market. And uh, if you jump back 10 years to one of my favorite moments in wine history, the Judgment of Paris, in which Europe had been basically making fun of America, saying that we couldn't make real wine. And America was like, you bet. And so a bunch of wine experts got together in Paris and did blind tastings of wines to determine the best wines in the world, two of which ended up being American, which is great. And it really created this idea that wine could be a premium product in America, but the Gallows weren't even invited to include their wine, which is a bit of a slap in the face given the fact that they were the bigwigs. So they really wanted to move in on the premium of the world. Uh, pause on Ernest and Julio for a second. Let's go back and see what their little brother Joe Jr. is up to. So Joe Jr. did military and then he worked for the Gallows for a little bit and then he split off on his own because he really liked cows and he made a dairy farm. Uh, and he started selling this cheese um, that was really like, it was bulk cheese. It was not high quality cheese, but it was decent cheese. Uh, only that wasn't its original name. Its original name was Joseph Gallo Farms. The Gallows didn't want their name associated with bulk anymore though. And so they sued their little brother for use of his name. And Joe Jr. Uh, to his credit, filed a countersuit saying, hey, you remember when our parents died and it was supposed, their estate was supposed to be split into three parts and that didn't really happen and now you have this giant winery? I want a third of it, uh, which was a big deal. Like that is some major backbone for Joe, given that like from what I can tell from all the research I've done, Joe just really wanted his older brothers to like him. Here's a quote from that article. Ernest was all powerful. He was God in Joe's mind. He would no more think of asking why he didn't have a share in the winery than he would ask me why I can't fly. Yet he filed that countersuit, um, which is a bit of a mess because the gallows were super private. Uh, Ernest gave one major interview and he didn't allow it to be released until after his death uh, or until 1995, I think, which was before his death, Never mind. Still, uh, and so during the court proceedings, all sorts of gallo dirt got them dug up. Like most of this talk comes from things that came out during those court proceedings. So it was a little bit of a slap back, but in the end, E and J Gallo won and Joe Jr. had to change the name of his company. Uh, nowadays, it's, 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 still a, it's still a Gallo family business. Like Ernest and Julio are both gone and so is Joe Jr. Uh, but after Ernest passing his son, Joe Gallo, not to be confused with Joe Jr., his father, Joe Sr., uh, <laughs> took over as CEO. And this year, Joe's son, Ernest, God, Gallo's, come up with some new names, will be taking over as the CEO. And there are a lot of other Gallo's who are involved, like my favorite, only because of this quote. 
wine isn't just in my blood, it's in my hair, it's in my clothes. <laughs> Great. Um, and they still are a major part of the wine market. So this is from 2011, but it kind of goes to show you this pink spot over here uh, on the left is Ian J. Gallo Winery. Uh, the orange spot kind of right of the middle, that is a uh, constellation who owns all of these who the gallows are buying right now. Um, so it's about to go from this to that's how much the gallows own. Anyway, that is the actual story of Ian J. Gallo Winery. Thank you. Do you have any questions? <laughs> Yeah, so I want to know, you, you mentioned that they, uh, during, during Prohibition, were, uh, let me find the exact quote. All right, they're, they, they wanted to make unaged wine. Um, I am a, I, I know nothing about wine except that it's usually red or white or some <laughs> kind of thing. Um, and I do know that beer, like you have, it has to be like, you know, it's like takes the absolute minimum of like three and a half weeks to make from when you're like, I'm going to make some beer to when you can drink it. What is the absolute minimum that it takes from when you say, I'm gonna turn the scrape into wine until you can drink it? So it depends on the technique. Um, this is the reason that like Beaujolais Nouveau is interesting because it's the first wine at the harvest and they use a different fermentation technique. They use malolactic fermentation, which the gallows are actually like very against. Um, I don't know what technique they used. I also don't know that they did the absolute minimum. From what I understand, they shipped out wine that was definitely still in the process of fermenting, but people were desperate, so they didn't care. I, I admire their efficiency. <laughs> Listen, you finally get alcohol back, you're gonna drink whatever. Right, I guess. And uh, you know, that way you can maybe ferment it yourself in your own stomach, so you're, you're feeling like you're contributing to the process. <laughs> That's the yeah, that's the spirit. Um, so I think this would also I, this would make a good documentary. So if you want to uh, ask Seth for some tips, how did I you? How did you? The Gallows be an HBO show for so long. So let's make this happen. How did you stumble upon this weird little piece of wine history? So I, I studied wine in college. Weirdly enough, I'm a certified wine snob, uh, no. which I never use for anything other than nerd night, uh, and. I think this came up a little bit in my research, but one day I stumbled upon a book called Gallo Be Thy Name. There's two books about the gallows and read it and I was like, holy shit, this is amazing. Uh, I did, I happened to watch just last week, I stumbled upon the uh, Sour Grapes documentary on Netflix or Hulu or Amazon about the uh, the the guy who basically made a bunch of or counterfeit wine that he tried to pass off and made millions of that. Um, have you ever tried to make a counterfeit wine? Uh, I wish. No, I've never tried to make wine in general. In college at one point, we wanted to get really sciencey and make ice vine, uh, which is like frozen on the vine typically is how it's made. And then when it's pressed, the because the water is crystallized, there's less of it in the juice. So it creates this like much thicker, sweeter dessert wine. Uh, we were gonna try to make ice wine using liquid nitrogen in the science lab. <laughs> we never got around to it. Well, it sounds like something you should do the next time you have access to a lab. Um, final, final couple of questions. Um, was there ever any additional investigation into the parents' deaths? And, uh, when, and also, has there been any additional investigation into the uh, Fresno murder-suicide? Uh, so, the, those are that's the same event, but yeah, um, right. not really. I, the the official ruling was that it was a murder suicide, and and there, are, it's possible, it's possible that it was. Uh, some theories are that it was related to Mike Gallo's mafia ta mafia ties. My theory, obviously, is that it was Ernest because it's just a little too convenient. Uh, but that's part of the reason that the Gallo family has been so so averse to publicity and, and being open, why they're so secretive. This is some murder stuff in their past. I, I guess that's understandable when you're trying to take over the, uh, the wine world. Yeah. All right, so go ahead. Um, you can stop your screen share. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for a very weird story. <laughs> Thanks that's, for having me. Uh, hey. No problem. All right. So everyone watching, uh, please give a big virtual round of applause to Seth, Ricardo, Francis, and uh, Rachel for 
delighting us for the last 107 minutes on this second edition of Nerd Night Stream You in September. I want to remind all of you that we've got four more presentations coming up, same time, same place, next Sunday, September 20th, again at 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific, 6 Mountain, 7 Central, 10 a.m. Melbourne and Sydney, 1 a.m. London, 2 a.m. Paris or Bordeaux in this case, if you want to drink wine early on a Monday morning and, and watch Nerd Night. Um, also, I want to remind all of you, this has been recorded. It will live right here on Facebook at the Nerd Night Facebook page. Uh, the recording will be posted literally within about a minute from when I stop talking. So I'll send the link around just in case you want to send it to your friends, your colleagues, uh, or whatnot, and, and watch it again. So thanks, everyone. I really Appreciate it. Um, you know, Rachel, Francis, you're still there. Feel free to pop on your video and wave goodbye. Um, you know, because we all like we all like waving. Um, yes, great, cool. All right, so thanks everyone. Uh, see you back in 166 hours and do something fun and safe uh, in the interim. Good night, everyone.